Extinction Rebellion came out of a year and a half of research between activists and academics with a sort of blank sheet of paper and at the top of the blank sheet of paper was two words, catastrophic failure, 30 years of climate activism, 60% increase in carbon emissions, E minus, right? That's what we were looking at. So we decided to get rid of all the conventions and start anew. That was the plan. Like, what exactly do we need to do in order to save your generation? That's the question. So, um, I'll just plough into it. <laughs> I've, <coughs> I've got 27 pages of facts and figures at home, which I'm not going to read through because they're at home, but um, I'm not going to do it anyway. <coughs> But one of the dubious pleasures of being a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion is that um, the world's top scientists ring you up and top diplomats and politicians and entrepreneurs and it's a little bit like a confession service because they're all shitting themselves and they want someone, they want to tell someone how absolutely fucked we are and they choose us. So it's not just me, but there's other people like Claire Farrell and blah 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 and every time, every time um, you know, you're going to talk to one of these guys, like have a sort of dry nest in your throat, you know, because you know you're going to be given some awful information and it's going to take you two days to get over it. Um, so I'm probably going to spend the rest of my life telling the great British public what they need to know uh, because no one's really telling people what you should know. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is um, go through a climate crisis in about three stories and make three fundamental points. Um, so this is story number one. I've just started. Story number one. Okay, uh, about six months ago, there was an article in the uh, Conversation. Do some people know that? So uh, like the world's top academics write these articles for everyone else about what's happening in the world. And there was an article about net zero, and it's a bit of a mere culpa, it's a confession by three of the world's top scientists. And it's been downloaded about two million times or something like that, so it's gone viral. And the reason it's gone viral is because there's like a sort of bombshell paragraph in the middle of it. If you read these articles by scientists, if you notice this, they waffle, and then in about paragraph six they tell you the bad news and then they waffle again. It's about paragraph seven. So this is more or less a direct quote. They said that all these three top scientists don't know have been in the industry for like 80 years collectively. They're main guys, right? All professors or whatever it is. Anyway, they were at Paris in 2015, like six years ago, yeah? And they said, it took them six years to get around to saying this. They said, at the Paris Agreement of 2015, we did not know of a single scientist who thought that 1.5 degrees was possible. Okay? We did not know of a single scientist who thought that the climate, the, the Paris Agreement was, was going to work. So I did a Facebook post about it and I said, you should put that on your fridge and read it every morning when you come down for your breakfast, right? Until you're in a raging, fucking raging whatever, right? Because for the last six years, the whole climate industry, and it's still doing this down the road, right? Going on about something that's physically not possible. Like 1.5 is done. It was done in 2016. Like, remember, right? As a Paris Agreement, it was about 2,000 scientists, right? So it wasn't just a few bad apples paid by the carbon industry. It was the whole damn thing. It's a systematic lying to the general public. So all those kids, and maybe some of you have done this, like marching around Sydney and Berlin with little signs saying, follow the science, stay under 1.5, right? They're all going to be mad as hell. They're probably mad as hell already. Maybe some of you are mad as hell. Because you've been lied to. Everything I'm going to tell you is nothing about me, by the way. I don't think this is a Roger Hallam routine, right? This, I'm just the messenger, I'm telling you what these top scientists said. Now because I'm semi-famous, because I'm a co-founder of XR, 
I can email people and get to have a chat, which is rather handy. So I had a conversation with one of them. So he's on Zoom and he's looking a bit white and sheepish, as you can imagine. And I said to him, what's the story about 1.5 not being feasible six years ago? And he said, well, Roger, what you've got to understand about the, the world's top scientists is they're overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly middle class, overwhelmingly from the global north, overwhelmingly at the world's most elite universities. They're tenured professors, right? They're a tiny demographic. And then he said, and this is a direct quote, they don't want to rock the boat. So even before you start thinking about what fuckery is coming down the road, you have to understand the social context, right? I'm an award-winning social scientist at King's College. I've left, naturally. Got onto that in a bit, right? I know my stuff. I'm a professional interpreter of social reality. Do you know what that means? It means when people talk about the science, it doesn't come down from God, it comes through a social process. And that social process is for the power relationship, prejudices and private agendas. Okay? Don't take it off a face value. You're being lied to, systematically lied to. It's been going on for 30 years, right? We're heading well over two degrees centigrade. So my first proposition to you is that you don't listen to experts. Which sounds a bit conspiracy-ish, doesn't it? So don't quote me. What I'm suggesting you do is listen to experts who are retired. Do you get it? because they don't give a damn. So who I suggest you listen to is Sir David King. Sir David King, as you may know, is the chief scientific advisor to the British government in the Blair and Brown administrations, right? He's a top five scientist in this country. Right, he's up there, right? It's pure establishment. But the important thing to understand about Sir David King is he's retired, right? He's 72, he doesn't give a damn, he's gonna be dead soon. Right? So he's in Australia. <laughs> Six months ago, I know the people who put this on, a, a think tank there, and he's on record, you can look it up on the internet, and he said, um, we have to act quickly. What we do, I believe, in the next three to four years, will determine the future of humanity. So I'm sure you're a bright lot, I'm sure there's a few social science students here. So, what do we know about Sir David King? What we know about Sir David King is his pure Oxbridge. What do we know about the British ruling class? They talk in euphemisms, right? Read the history of World War I, got a slight problem on the front, all that crap, yeah? What does he mean when he says, in the next three to four years, we will determine the future of humanity. What do you think he means? He means billions of people are going to starve to death. That's what he means, doesn't he? That's what he means. What could he not mean, right? I know Tom, um, I know a leading, I won't mention his name because it's been recorded. I know a leading London lawyer, right? He's famous. He knows Sir David King. I privately know Sir David. I privately know Sir David King won't use the word billion. Why is that? Because Oxbridge people don't talk about death. Right? They talk about it in the working class suburbs of this city. Right? They talk about it on the agricultural holdings that grow your food for your supermarkets, because that's where I come from. But they don't talk about it up there because they want to control the whole thing. So he said at this conference, he said, we're at 500, in part, we're at 500 parts per million of CO2 equivalent, right? That's all the greenhouse gases. Forget about just CO2, right? It's everything. It's pretty obvious. We're at 500 parts per million of CO2 equivalent. Then he said, and this is the direct quote, he said, there is no carbon budget. Okay? top scientist in this country, 
There is no carbon budget, we've burnt too much fossil fuels already, and we have to go into reverse. So, my proposition to you is that in five years' time, there will be three guilt-stricken establishment scientists writing the conversation, and you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, at COP26 in Glasgow 2021, we did not know of a single scientist who thought there was a carbon budget left. Yeah? No one thinks there's a carbon budget left. Go to some of the pubs at 11 o'clock in this city this week and ask them. There's no carbon budget left. The critical decade was 2010 to 2020. That's what the UN said at the time. But you can't have endless critical decades. The 2020s is a decade of consequences. It's just the way it is. So that's fact number one. That's the first thing I'm trying to communicate. We're all being systematically lied to. And God help you if you're not mad as hell about it. Number two, how bad is it? How bad is it? Who's telling you how bad it is? Not in this city. I'm going to do like a talk tonight. And the main point of my talk tonight is, why hasn't anyone in the whole of COP said the word fuck? Right? What does that tell you? It tells you that the people at this conference are like that. They're a little slither of the global elite. Got what I was going to say now. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, this is fucking bad. <laughs> right. Okay, well, when we started Extinction Rebellion, you know, I was doing my Heading for Extinction talk. You know, I did the first Heading for Extinction talk and it all got, all the fucks got taken out of it, dare I say it. But it's like, no one was quite sure, right? There was a little bit of fuzziness. There was a little bit of fuzziness on what the science is saying. So, it's 2021. There's not any fuzziness anymore. It's done, right? The numbers are in. We've got the numbers. We've got the peer-reviewed papers. I read two or three peer-reviewed papers a day, okay? I know my stuff. I've been doing it for five years. I just get acres of it in my inbox, right? I've got someone that organises it for me. Okay, so I'm just going to choose one paper, right? It's about heat. Forget sea level rise, what's, you know, blah, 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 right? It's heat. It's heat that's going to kill people. What's happening with heat? So read this paper. The, the future of the human niche. The future of the human niche. What does that mean? Translate that into normal Glaswegian language. What it means is, who's going to live and who's going to die? Right? That's what it means. The human niche. Where people can live and, oh, no, if you're outside that, you're going to die, right? So it turns out, turns out in this paper, it's a little bombshell of a paper, meaning it was on page five of the Guardian for like two hours. Yeah? What this paper say? It said, at two degrees centigrade, two degrees centigrade, yeah, everyone knows about that. Blah, blah, blah. Load of bollocks, right? Two degrees centigrade is not like a good stat. People here know about stats, right? There's good stats and bad stats, isn't there? Two degrees centigrade, staying under two degrees centigrade, you're going to stay under two degrees centigrade as a global average temperature, right? The problem is, 60-70% of the Earth's surface is water. No one lives on the water. Enough stat. The stat you want is the temperature rise where people are going to live, right? Pretty basic. You're not going to get into Glasgow University doing a two degrees thing, right? You want to know the temperature in Cairo, in Bangladesh, in Paris, right? That's where you want the temperature to know what the temperature is going to be. So what does it say in this paper? It said in this paper that two degrees centigrade, the temperature in land where people actually live is going to be seven degrees. Have you talked about that cop yet? Peer-reviewed paper, world top scientists, blah, 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 right? This isn't some maverick guy down the pub. This is top-notch science. So stick that on your fridge, right, until you're mad as hell. Because for the last six years, everyone's been going, stay under two degrees, and everyone's going, what the fuck, that's fine, it's just a little bit warmer. Seven degrees, that changes everything, doesn't it? Can you imagine in 2018, we said, we're going over fucking seven degrees, right, in 10, 15 years, 
Right? There'll be half a million people out on the street, but they don't know because they're being lied to, because the whole thing's rigged, right? It's seven degrees, right? It was 38 degrees in London like two years ago. It's the hottest day ever. I was there. 38 degrees, right? I could like, stand outside for about two minutes. Right? It's going to be 30 degrees on the average day in London. 30 degrees. That means it'll be 45 on a hot day. 45 degrees on a hot day. In 15, 20 years' time. Right? It was 49 degrees in British Columbia this summer, right? Does everyone know that? 49 degrees and sub. Do you know what British Columbia is like? British Columbia is like Wales. Right? I lived in Wales for 20 years, right? Growing carrots. I know Wales. Like 16 degrees is a hot day in Wales. It's a bit like Glasgow. Yeah? 49 fucking degrees. The thing you've got to understand about 49 degrees is everything melts, right? The wiring melts, the roads melt, right? That village that it was 49 degrees and it burnt down three days later. Think about that. So, I went to, um, did my little XR thing, yeah? So I said, I'm Roger Harlan from XR, can I have a chat please? Because I didn't want to get it wrong. So, um, I talked to one of the authors, so he's on Zoom, so he's got his little telephone and he's walking his dog in a Rotterdam park, right? So he's professor of climate change at Rotterdam University, something like that, 65 years old, he's the main deal, yeah? So it's, on, it's a surreal conversation as he walks his dog and I'm saying, sorry to disturb you, but could you just confirm that two degrees is actually seven degrees? And you know what he said? He said, yes. But then he said, we were so surprised, we spent another two years doing research on it. Right? Do you understand what this person is? This person is one of the top brains in the world, spends years studying one stat. When he's saying seven degrees, he means seven. He doesn't mean six, he doesn't mean eight, right? The world's top computers are all on this job. That's what they say. So the reason why it's a bombshell paper, apart from that, is they have the courage to actually, you know, actually go, what does that mean? So what they say is, is that uh, two, uh, between two and three degrees, at the moment, there's one percent of the Earth's surface, which is like de desert, yeah? This is about technical as it gets. Right, the Sahara, one, one percent. So at three degrees centigrade, that's 20 percent. It's probably the most important stat I'm going to tell you. Think about that. So it's 1% goes to 20% in 15, 20 years. So that's like the whole of, the, the whole of Central America, it's the southwest of the United States, it's southern Europe, it's Africa, it's the Middle East, it's northern India, it's most of Australia. That's all desert. You can't grow anything. Right? I'm a farmer, I'm telling you, you can't grow stuff at 30 degrees centigrade. Because 30 degrees centigrade doesn't mean 30 degrees, right? It means 50 degrees on a hot day. That's where you're going to lose your crops. So what does that mean? So at 2 degrees centigrade, according to them, at 2 degrees centigrade, a thousand million people will be on the move. A thousand million people will be on the move. At 2 degrees, so when's that? 2035, 2040, maybe 2028, you know, you never know, do you, with me saying? So what does that mean? Of course they stop there, because they're nice middle class academics that won't want to actually talk about it. But I'm from King's College, there's a whole war studies department at King's College, right? There's plenty of people know exactly what a thousand million people on the move looks like, right? But they're such cowards that they won't tell the general public. Yeah? I did a like a hunger strike at King's College. Not a fucking one single lecturer came out to support me. They're all cowards. They know what's going on. They know what a thousand million people by 2035 on the road looks like. It's like Syria. Syria is five million internal refugees. Half a million people are dead. Do the maths. We're looking at a hundred million of those people being dead. They don't just get up one day and politely move off from the Sahara 
Sahel, right? Where are they going to go anyway? There's a Sahara in the way. They're going to be dead. 100 million of them. Two World War Twos in a decade. By the time you're in your 30s. According to peer-reviewed papers. Okay? That's what you've got to look forward to. So what does that mean? Are you, you, are you pretty resilient students? hope you are. Last time I said this to a bunch of students, one of them came up to me and said, I can't use the word rape. All right, I'm a sociologist. Let me tell you, right? I'm a sociologist. I have a responsibility to tell you what the reality is. Okay? And you have a responsibility. I'm serious here. You have a responsibility to hear the truth because you're the future leaders, right? You're Glasgow University, you're an elite university. You have a responsibility to look at reality because if you don't, the world's fucked, okay? Don't think you don't have responsibility. You need to know what social collapse looks like. Social collapse is starvation, slaughter and rape, right? There's hundreds of academic papers on it. They don't want to be in academic papers, they want to be told in the community centres of this city, right? Congo, in the 2000s, the biggest example of social collapse since World War II. Five million deaths, two million rapes. That's the reality of what's coming down the road for people who are totally innocent, right? It's the biggest fucking injustice in the history of humanity. That's what it is. This is not a little blur, blur, blur campaign, right? I mean, I've been doing social activism, dare I say it, since I was 14, okay? There's nothing, there's nothing I've been doing for the last 40 years that remotely compares with this moment in history. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the really bad news next. With a ladder. Okay. <laughs> Improvise. I left. I left my um, visual aid on um, King's, King's Cross Station this morning. There we go. You have to understand, right? All the big revolutions in world history didn't have powerpoints. Okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> 1848 didn't have PowerPoints, okay? 1917, no fucking PowerPoints. Don't get seduced by technology. Right? The ladders in London pubs, right? 1905, when they founded the Communist Party. Not Communist, by the way, don't tell them right? They had little bits of paper. I know. All right. Here's the really bad news. So you already know the bad news. You, know, you already know the really bad news. The really bad news is you've got three to four years. Okay? I'll just say that again, right? My friend Tracy, she goes on national news. We just like, we do like training sessions. Say, Tracy, just say three to four years. Three to four years. Three to four years. Three to four years. Why, why is that? Because slowly the people in this country are finally realising you've got three to four years. People come up to a street now and they go, what's this about three to four years? So David King says it's three to four years before we lose that, right? Because the world's a big geophysical feedback shaboodle, right? There is an end point. For the first time in 10,000 years, there's an end point to human existence, which is when all these feedbacks happen and they're in three to four years. You should have been doing this in 2011, right? Shouldn't we? I was weeding carrots, sorry about that. <laughs> I thought someone else was going to sort it out. Um, okay, so the Arctic, 2030 uh, peer reviewed papers, right? Everyone knows that? 2030 peer review papers, maybe 2035, the Arctic's going to be melted in the summer. That's it. Endo 
That's it, game over, right? No one, no one knows how to refreeze the Arctic. Don't let anyone tell you, right? And talk to the world's leading scientists. I'm not talking about geoengineering, engineering. You might be able to slow it down. But once it's gone, it's gone, right? Because the latent heat effect, there's all this dark water. Everyone should know this, right? Do you know your climate science? Please look up your, your climate science, right? Dark water absorbs heat, melts the ice, left more dark water. It's a feedback system going down the hill, right? It's an exponential process. Right, that's it. It's growing. 70% gone already. Right, that's the first lung of the planet. Second lung of the planet is the Amazon. Do you know the stats on the Amazon? Peer reviewed paper, 2020, 20%, 25% is the tipping point. The Amazon cannot exist unless it has a minimum size, right? It's a massive ecology. It exists because it exists. If it doesn't exist, it's never going to exist again. Right? Everyone understands that, right? It's ecology. Right, the rain goes off, it comes down, it blows, blah, blah, blah. Right, we cut it down. So what's the stats? 20 to 25% cut down, it's gone. <clears throat> How much has been cut down? 17%. How much was cut down last year by that fascist guy? I never can pronounce his name. Oh, yeah, him. <laughs> How much did he cut down last year? 1%. Do your maths. 1%. 17, 20, three, three years. Sir David King, three to four years. And that's conservative, okay, because peer-reviewed papers came out, like, two months ago, saying it's already, like, a source, right, for carbon. It's not a sink anymore. Like, when I was a kid, they were talking about the Amazon. And then when I was in my 20s, they were talking about the Amazon. When I was in the 30s, my 30s they were talking about an Amazon. And now there's not going to be the Amazon. Right? There's a real world out there. That's what it was. That's why he's saying three to four years. So, you know, like 200 years ago, you know, you'd be all, all in this, this room and you'd be going, slavery is really bad because, you know, it took 50 years to get rid of slavery, if, if you know your history, right, in this country. And you'd be going, slavery is obscene, it's disgusting, it's outrageous, we're going to stop it. And you'd all be trying to stop it. And you try really hard to stop it. And at the end of the year, you wouldn't succeed, right? But you knew that next year, Slavery would be obscene, disgusting and outrageous, but it wouldn't be ten times as bad, would it? You get it? Right? When my grandparents fought Hitler, it was like Hitler was like the personification of evil, we're going to get rid of the guy. He's not going to last forever. This is going to last forever, isn't it? 100,000 years. Maybe it's four million years, who gives a fuck? In the next three to four years, it's absolutely essential that you use your brains on this, right? This is not a fucking campaign. It's the end of the world. It means you have to, like, give up all your preconceptions of what doing a little trendy university campaign is about. That's not the deal. Okay? There's millions of people dying as I speak. Right? It just hasn't got to this country yet. But it will. It's coming, right? I can't grow vegetables anymore. But who gives a fuck, right? I'm just like a little Welsh farmer. But it's coming, because it's physics. So this is your little analogy, is here's your kid on a Glasgow park, and he kicks the ball, yeah? Kicks the ball, everyone knows this story. The little toddler kicks the ball, it goes down the hill. The toddler's running after the ball, yeah? How does that story finish? How does the story finish? There's only two ends to the story, isn't that? He either catches the ball or he doesn't catch the ball. Yeah? It's a binary. It's an absolute binary. You either catch it or you don't. That's what Sir David King's saying, right? That's what Johann Jostrom of the Potsdam Institute is saying. That's what all the leading world scientists are saying. They're not saying it's a problem and we can half sort it out. They're saying we get it or it's gone, right? It's gone. That's the ball, right, it's here, right? I'm gonna to come to Glasgow University in two years time. It's gonna be here. So, you're gonna try really hard in Glasgow, aren't you? To sort out the climate crisis. Maybe you're gonna to get to number one. This is where we're talking about the strategy. You're gonna to get to number one, you're gonna be great. We've got to number one. No, no, no. Number one, you haven't caught the ball. It's no good, is it? Right? So you're going to try really hard 
When you're going to get to number two, you're going to run really hard to get to number two. You're not going to catch the ball. Number one is the same as number two. You're still going to absolutely fail. That's what it means, yeah? If you want to save your generation the next thousand generations, you've got to get to point three, to be in the ballpark, right? This is fundamental strategic information. Understand what I'm trying to say. Right? I'm not trying to be unpleasant. I'm not trying to upset you, right? You know, if you go to a doctor in this city and he says you've got cancer, it's because you've fucking got cancer, right? That's the way it is. Right, we have to get to point three. Don't kill the messenger, right? It's not the doctor's fault. It's not Roger Hallam's fault. It's physics, it's maths. That's the situation, that's the deal. It's not Hitler, right? It's not slavery, it's climate. There's an end point. So David King, top scientist, right? Three to four years. That's why traces on Good Morning Britain ignoring all the crappy fucking questions and going, we've got three to four years left. We've got three to four years left. We've got three to four years left, right? And you know what the, you know what the interviewer said? He said, you've been trained, haven't you? Right, because he's the first fucking working class woman that gets on mainstream British media that doesn't take, take any shit. Because you've been trained, of course. Two and a half hours, role playing. That was the interview. I always like leaving a fascist interview by the way. So. All right. So there you go. Sorry about that. So I'm going to give you the good news. So the good news also includes the worst news. So the good news is... Ready? The good news is... The good news is that it's entirely possible to get to point three. Bang. It's entirely possible, right? Everything I've told you so far is just what I've been told, okay? You know, just go and look it up on the internet, right? What I'm going to tell you for the next, like, 20 minutes is what I know, because I'm a specialist in political change, right? That's why Extinction Rebellion was successful, it's because you had some brainy people sort it out, right? Not just me, but a bunch of people. Don't underestimate the power of brains. That's why you're here. That's your job to think clearly about it, right? You've got all your emotions spinning around in your head. You have to think clearly if you're going to win. You have to think how, how are you going to get to point three? Because you're the future leaders. How are you going to do it? Everyone knows how to do it, right? All the sociologists of political change know how to do it. Because it's been done over and over and over again in history. The problem is, you're not doing it. Okay? With the greatest respect. <laughs> you're not even fucking close. With all due respect. That's the way it is. Because, surprise, surprise, history is full of situations where people face annihilation. You know, we just had 30 years of niceness, right? Before 1989, for the previous 5,000 years, every 30, 50 years, cultures face annihilation. It's central to human culture. Everyone knows what it looks like, right? You know, my grandparents were making, like, bombs in Derby when they were 18 years old. They were shitting themselves because they thought they were going to be raped and slaughtered by Hitler's troops. Think about that. That wasn't that nice, was it? You know, if you were like a working class kid, teenager in the city in 1914, you know what's going to happen, right? 70% of those kids were going to have their intestines blown out on the, on the trenches. That's not nice. That's history, okay? When I was 14, I thought, phew, the world's great. And then someone told me there was going to be a nuclear war and we're all going to be blasted to forever, right, in the nuclear winter. It took me two fucking years to recover from that, right? Every second I wasn't studying, I was like sitting in the bloody roads, right? That's what my generation... Well, my generation didn't think we had ten years. My generation thought we had two, right? Don't think there's anything special. Now all this self-pity stuff. Right? 
It happens again and again. Get with the programme. Toughen up, because you're gonna to have to toughen up. I know, it's not politically correct to say so, but I'm not politically correct, right? I'm a sociologist, I'm 55 years old. I've seen some shit. You've got to toughen up. It's gonna to be tough. So what have you got to do? What do people do over and over in history? What they do is whatever is necessary to change the situation, okay? That's your starting point. And you know, you've got your big sheet of paper next week, go, okay, everyone that saw Roger's talk, we're all gonna to get together. Write that on the front of the paper. Whatever is necessary, okay? So I'm gonna give you a little example. All the times people change history, they do more or less the same thing, particularly like over the last 100 years. So I'm going to give you a little example. Don't get too like het up about the example, right? It's just an example. The Freedom Riders, 1961, right? The Civil Rights Movement started in 1968, had a massive success in Montgomery. 20,000 people like boycotted the buses. Massive success. Martin Luther King became famous. Everyone think it was great. What happened afterwards was nothing often happens. By 1961, there were a whole load of people of your age and they were so fucked off. Right? They'd had 90 years. You might be miserable because you had 30 years and nothing happened on the climate. Those guys had 90 years of nothing happening. Right? And desegregation and all the rest of it. So what did they do? They decided to do whatever is non-violently necessary. So they hatched a scheme. They got on a bus, black and white people on a bus. They didn't go down to Virginia, right? where they'd just be taken off the bus, you know, maybe stand, spend the night in prison and, you know, be sent back to New York. No, they went down to the heart of darkness, to the most fascist, racist state in the centre of the American South. And what happened to them? They got dragged off the bus, they were beaten up, the bus was set on fire and they were put in prison. They did whatever was non-violently necessary to get shit done. You understand where I'm, where I'm coming from, right? This is... This is history, right? This has been going on like every 30 years, for thousands of years. Well, what's interesting is, three days later, 24 students, all about your age, 20, 21, right? Set off from Atlanta, to Montgomery to do the same thing. Think about that. 24 students set off, they get to Montgomery, right, they were pulled off the bus, they were beaten up, they were hated so much, the ambulance drivers wouldn't even take them to hospital. That's how much people hated them. You think Insulate Britain is a bit tricky. Look at, like, Freedom Riders 1961, right? There's this guy in hospital, his bandages around his head, you can see it, right? Go and look it up on the internet. Right, and they say, God, you're in a bit of way. He's going, yeah. Saying, what you're going to do is say, I'm getting up tomorrow morning, I'm getting back on the bus. You understand what he's doing? He's changing history. That's what you have to do. That's what you're going to have to do to save your generation. Go to hospital, come out the following day. Get back on the road. That's how people change history. Why did they set off from Atlanta, right? What reason did they give? Don't think this was some easy little routine, right? These were black kids. Their parents had like saved up for decades to get them into university. And in three days, they decided to drop the whole thing. Why did they do it? Because they could not afford to lose. Does that sound familiar? They could not afford to lose. You cannot afford to lose. This whole fucking movement cannot afford to lose. Because you've got three to four years, right? If you had 50 years, like, I'd be off to Corsica to lie on a beach for three months because I'm fucking knackered, right? Why do I get up at eight o'clock in the morning and work a 12 hour day, every fucking day for two years? It's because we've got no time to lose, right? I know what it looks like. When I was 18, I went to India, right, to work for a civil rights organization. The week before I got there, 20 workers were shot and the police went into the villages and raped the women. Right? I know. I know what it looks like. You know what the guy said to me? He said, get the fuck back to the global north and have a revolution. That's what I did. 
Right, I've got a scholarship to London School of Economics. I'm super bright, right? I could be running one of those fucking NGOs, right? But I didn't. I left. I left after a year and I spent 10 years working 12 hours a day for £50 a week. Okay? People do that. Read some history. That's quite fun, actually. Dare I say? Life goes on. So that's what they did. You see, you see where I'm getting at here? Right? You know, one step at a time, sweet Jesus, all that sort of stuff. But that's the direction of travel. Right? That's, that's how you get to point three. Because after they got beaten up, another group came down, and they got beaten up, another group came down, and then they got organised and they just put them into prison. And by the end of the summer, there were 400 people, 430 people doing hard labour in parchment prison, right? It wasn't like Pentonville, right? Or Wandsworth, I've been to those prisons. They're quite nice. This was Parchment, 1961. And then they cracked the most powerful government in the world in 1961. They cracked. 400 people changed history in four months. It's happened again and again and again, right? Read your history of revolution. It happens again and again and again. And it's always because a small group of people do whatever is necessary because they can't afford to lose, right? Bang, bang, bang. That's it. That's the only way you're going to do it. You know, I'm not being unpleasant. Believe me, right? I'm looking at you, right? You're looking really worried. It's all right, right? I'm a nice guy, honestly. I'm a nice guy, right? My mum was a Methodist minister, right? She told me not to swear. It's not about me. I'm just being compassionate towards you by telling you that you're fucked, unless you get to point three, right? If I thought you could get to point three by going on a march around Glasgow each day this week, fantastic, I haven't got anything against marchers. I haven't got anything against marchers. I've advised, you know, I'm a campaign advisor. If you want to pick up litter along this street, go on a fucking march. Fantastic, get job done. This is not litter. Right? This is not a polluted river in Glasgow. This is the end of the fucking world. And you have to become revolutionaries. That's the only way you're going to do it. It's no big deal. People did in 1989. You know, 1946, 1917, 1871, 1848, 1789. It's just, a, it's just our tradition. When shit happens, people become revolutionaries. Okay. I forgot to tell you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, here's the modern, here's the modern. I'm going to get onto Intellect Grin in a minute and what you've all got to do. <clears throat> okay, so some of you might be thinking, okay, okay, so that's like, you know, that's out there, that's on Netflix, you know, those are those heroes in the past, you know, switch it off, switch it on, blah, 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 you can still go down to Tesco's and pick up, you know, what's the problem, you know, that sort of routine, right? But these dynamics were what propelled Extinction Rebellion, right? So that's only two years ago. Right? You, all, you all know about April 2019, maybe some of you were there. Right? That was great! It was 10,000 people, it changed history, right? Wow, amazing! How did that happen? It nearly didn't happen. So i tell you the inside story, right? In, in, at Christmas 2018, I did a 23-page strategy document. It was really good. <laughs> Alright? I made it into a book. And then I got banned, so you can't get it anymore. Anyway, it's like, it was good. It was like, we're going to go to London. We're going to blockade London, blah, 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 right? And we presented it, me and the people who did it. It was a few other people, don't, it's all right, it wasn't just me. There were a few other people, right? And we presented it to Extinction Rebellion. There was about 30 people in the room. And do you know what people said? They said, Roger. They said, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You've got Brexit, right? 2019, do you remember? Everyone's talking about, no one's interested in the climate, right? Then they say, you're not going to get 10,000 people to London. You know, you're not going to get students down there. They're all rubbish. Blah, blah, right? Then they said, you can't get people arrested. 
You know, people don't like getting arrested. It's unpleasant. And then they said, if you get people arrested, it's going to upset people. You know that one? Right, Daily Mail is going to upset, get upset. So you shouldn't do it. And we said, we cannot afford not to take the risk. You get it? We cannot afford to take, not take the risk. In other words, not acting is the bigger risk. You have to act and be prepared to fail. Otherwise, you've already failed because you're not even getting to point three, right? You've got to like run like fucking hell and you might trip up, but at least you might get to number three. If you get to number two, forget it. You might as well just go and, you know, whatever. You see what I'm trying to say? You have to push. That's your job, right? It's the future fucking elites or whatever you are, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to push. You've got to go into Glasgow and go into those meetings and go, that's a great idea, let's do it ten times as big. Right? Ten times as big, you're in the ballpark. That's the biggest bit of tactical advice I say to people. Like, I talked to this German student, right, it's a bit of a tangent, but anyway, it's quite interesting. I talked to this German student, it's quite funny. He said, Roger, I've read all about you, I want to do some, you know, full-on stuff. I said, he said, right, I'm going to get my university to divest, right? And he said, he said, I said, that's cool. So he said, I saw what you did at King's College. You like threw paint around the Gothic Hall. I said, yeah, yeah, it's really good. And we won. He said, I'm going to do that. So he got like three little tubes of paint about this big, right? And he went to the front of the building and he, he, and he sort of like did a little, little picture about this big. And 5,000 people watched it on 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 social media and he'd get back on Zoom with me and said, Roger, I did what you said. I said, I said, I'm not going to say his name. I said, that's great, but you've got to do it like a hundred times bigger. And he said, oh, all right then. So, this is quite funny. A fortnight later, he comes back with five fire extinguishers, right? Right, this is like one of the poshest universities. It's got one of those modernist, you know, big, massive, black frontages. So he gets his multiple coloured paint and he goes and then he gets his next one. It's there like for about 15 minutes. And it's like the whole, it's like 50 metres of the front of this posh university in Germany. It's just splattered with multicoloured paint. And you know what happens? 200,000 people see it and everyone's going, that's so beautiful. <laughs> so much nicer than what it was before, right? <laughs> And then, do you know what happened? Got suspended <coughs> for a year, I think it is. Cool, he's getting somewhere, right? But the, really, the real story, the real story is then he goes, OK, Roger, I'm getting the hang of this. So he says, me and my mates, we're going to go on hunger strike during the election. So during the election, don't know if you've heard this story, you should know, right? The seven, seven students, the so young people, they went hunger strike like 30 days before the election. And they were asking the candidates for one hour public debate, right, with the young people in Germany about their annihilation, right? Seems reasonable, doesn't it? Green Party, Social Democrats, Conservatives, right? It's what's called a dilemma demand in the, in, in the trade, right? It's a small ask, it's no big deal. We're going on hunger strike, come and have a nice chat with us on t t a national telly. Right? No one, no one bothered about it for a few days. And then it's like, boosh! Every article in Germany was going, oh my God, there's these young people on unlimited hunger strike. Right? Notice, unlimited hunger strike. Yeah? And they kept going. And all the party leaders and their PR departments were phoning up and they were going, this is terrible, this is terrible. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. You know that routine? You're going to get hurt. Stop. And they're going, no. We're not stopping, right? Because it's like we clicked in our head. This is what you've got to do. And to cut a long story short, we got to day 28, and all the politicians were going, no, 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 no. So what did they do, right? They got it into their head about what to do. You do not stop, okay? You do not stop. So on day 28, they stopped drinking. They did dry hunger strike, and then they're in hospital. They're in hospital for a day and then they get rung up by the PR department of the Social Democrats and they're going, okay, we'll do a deal. Hmm, that's interesting. Do a deal. 
So, we'll have a little debate with you after the election, in private, right? Do you know what they did? Think, remember what they did. They said, no, right? Don't stop. What happened? An hour later, the candidate, the now future Chancellor of Germany, the most powerful politician in Germany, agreed to have a one hour debate in public after the election. That's how you're gonna fucking win, right? You have to keep going. That's how you win, right? That's why the Freedom Riders won, right? That's why the Suffragettes won. That's why ACT UP won, go and look it up. That's how people win, you have to keep going. All the Liberals will be ringing up going, you're being really unpleasant, blah, 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 right? You keep going and then you win and then you make history and then you inspire like thousands of people around the world. And that's how you change the world in six months. So, just coming back to, um, what's it talking about? Coming back to uh, April 2019. So this is interesting, I think it's interesting, hopefully it's interesting. Right, so, you know, April 2019, there was like five sites, we're going to take five sites, right? Same sort of story. So it's a big row in XR, so it goes a bit like this. They're going, we're just going to take Marble Arch. We're going to have Glastonbury and Marble Arch. We're going to have 10,000, you know, hippies and blah, blah, and students, and they're all going to dress up, and there'll be a few arrests, and we're going to have loads of music. And it's, it's just going to be great, you know, and we're going to be able to take it. And I said, it's fucked, right? Just taking Marble Arch... It's there. You see what I'm trying to say? It's, if you just take Marble Arch, you're going to be on page five of The Guardian in someone's PhD in Glasgow. You get what I'm trying to say? No one gives a fuck. It's like, there's a few people in my... If you're going to change history, you're going to have to take... If you're going to get to point three, you've got to take five sites. You've got to close down the whole fucking city. Right? That's what you've got to do. And they go, you're not going to be able to do that. And the police are going to stop you. And we said, we can't afford not to take the risk. You get it? So it could have been a complete washout. But we took the risk because unless we're in point three, there's no point, right? And on the first day of April 2019, I was in tears, right? I'm not the crying type because I'm an organic farmer. It's tough, right? <laughs> it's tough. You should try it. It lasts like two days, seriously. Right? The reason I was in tears was because it's so fucking stressful. Right? If we hadn't taken those five sites, that's it. There's no plan. We took the five sites and we won. Right? We won. We became the most powerful climate movement in 2019 globally, according to some posh thing. Right? How do we do that? By taking risks. Right? You've got to take risks. Please get it into your heads. You've got to take risks, right? Imagine the worst risk and times it by 10, right? Five fire extinguishers, remember, right? Make it 20. It's all right, life goes on. I got suspended from King's College, right? You know what I did? I said, fuck that. I went into the students' union and they came up to me, the security, and I said, yeah, I'm having a meeting. You know, it's my human right. So they had to drag me out. Ten days later, they, they brought me back in. You get it? It's all a game of poker, right? You're, you're right. This isn't, you know, some esoteric, like, you know, campaign. It's like the end of the world. They all know they're fucked. You have to push, and then you push again, and you push again, right? And that's what Insulate Britain has done, right? For God's sake, understand what it is about, right? It's a hundred people. A hundred people, right? Just think about this for a minute. A hundred people got 370 national news articles in six weeks. 370. Independent, The Times, right? Every fucking day. For hundred people. Why did they do that? Because they went on the motorways. No, they went on the motorways again and again and again and again, right? Over and over again. Right? This is what the working class sorted out in 1880. Go on strike. You don't go on strike for a day, do you? You go on strike over and over again, and then you win. That's what you have to do at Glasgow, right? If you want them to divest. Have they divested yet? Yeah. 
Oh, well, you can get the speed up. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm off. You've done it. That's it. Okay, so that's the gist with Insulate Britain, right? The gist with Insulate Britain is, yeah, it's about insulation, but it's not really about insulation. What it's about is inspiring a whole generation of people globally to understand how you make change happen, right? So if 100 people did that, think about what 1,000 people can do, okay? Those 100 people are more powerful than a million people on the street for a day. It's just a fact, right? It's a social, scientific fact. That's what you have to do. So that's the good news, and it's the bad news, right? Because there's 40 of you in this room. 40 of you in this room... Not quite. Yeah, I'm exaggerating. You're not <laughs> 37. <laughs> 40 of you can bring down the, the Scottish Government. Don't believe you can. You can. I'll do a design for you. <laughs> I'm serious, right? Don't pretend, don't pretend you don't have the power. Right? That's the most difficult message I've got for you. Don't pretend you can't do this shit. You just have to make a decision, right? Whether you're going to be sitting here in four years' time, like crippled with self-contempt because the ball's here. You get what I mean? Down here, right? All the people that stepped up to do Enslaved Britain have one thing in common, right? They can't live with themselves and not act, right? You get what I'm trying to say here? Right, it's this research about Nazi Germany and the Jews, right? You know all these people, they took in the Jews in World War II. Think about that for a moment. Why did people take in the Jews in World War II? Right, it's pretty dumb, right? Because if you found out, that's it. You're dead. Why did that happen? Why did some people take in the Jews and other people not take in the Jews? Right? It's a social scientific question. People do research on it. It turns out, it turns out there's no sociological determinism. Right? It's a nice big word for you. Right, what does that mean? It means it wasn't rich people, it wasn't poor people, right? It wasn't left-wing people, it wasn't right-wing people. It wasn't like rich or poor, it wasn't like rural, it wasn't Catholics or Protestants, right? There was no rhyme or reason to it. According to Tim Schneider, like, top researcher on it, you know what he said? The only thing people had in common was self-knowledge. Self-knowledge. What does that mean? It means they could not stand there. They could not be bystanders. They could not live with themselves and allow this absolute obscene, obscene fuckery to happen, right? That's what's happening today, right? Millions of people are bystanders, right? The whole of Glasgow University, all those people that saw the Instagram post, right? Why aren't they here? Because they're bystanders. Why are you here? Because you're not bystanders. You get it? You're the people. The whole thing depends on you. It's true. I'm not bollocksing you. It depends on you. And about 40 other groups of young people around the country. And I'm going around the universities and telling people this shit, right? Because I believe, and I've got some data, of course, I believe that you're ready for it, right? You're ready to hear this message. Well, some of you are. Okay, so I've gone slightly off message. Where am I going to finish? Um, it's actually pretty good being a revolutionary. I'm going to sell it to you from a self-interest point of view. All right, it's, it's okay, it's fine. In fact, studies have shown that revolutionaries are generally more happy than non-revolutionaries. <laughs> I made that up, by the way. <laughs> why is that? I don't know, by the way. But there is evidence. There is evidence. So I'll just give you... I'll finish with a little bit of... Uh, a little antidote. Antidote? Antidote. What's that? Anyway, that word. Um... Yeah, all these people that have stepped up to do Insulate Britain, right? There's, there's three Methodist ministers, I think, right? There's a whole bunch of single mothers, right? There's 
people doing jobs in their thirties. So there's a little bunch of anarchists. You know, there's always a bunch of anarchists. Uh, yeah, it's a whole higgledy piggledy bunch, right? Because they're all doing this self-knowledge thing, okay? And um, and they've all got into these block teams, and they've got this sense of community, right? And that's that's the real story here, is what I'm inviting you all to do is enter into solidarity with each other, not as a slogan, but as like an emotional reality, that you are there to support each other in this biggest story in human history. That's the situation. And the good news is, is that's an enormously fulfilling experience, okay? moving into community, because that's what everyone wants anyway. Yeah? So I'll just, keep fini I'll just finish with this story. So, as I said, like, I, I'm an organic farmer, right? No one cares about organic farmers. Um, so I, 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 for 20 years, I never saw anyone, right? Like the most exciting thing in my life was to go down to a local town on Saturday morning and buy hummus. Get the picture? Oh, it wasn't that exciting. I never saw any. So I'm actually really shy. Like, even now I'm thinking, they all think I'm a twat. But like, I'm driven to do this because of this, right? So I'm not doing this because from an ego thing, right? I just, I just want to go back to my farm, to be honest with you. Right? You see what I'm trying to say? <laughs> so in April 2019, I sort of became semi-famous because I'd done this plan and it all became world famous and everything. So all these people at Marble Arch, they all sort of, they've seen me on my videos and I'm walking down through Marble Arch and there's all these people staring at me. Have you ever experienced that? Has anyone here felt semi-famous? Anyway, people stare at you and you go, oh, like this. And then they come up to you and they go, are you Roger Hallam? And I go, oh, yeah, yeah. And then they went, Roger, I need to tell you this. I've been arrested over the last two weeks, been arrested, and go, been arrested, been arrested four times, four times in the last fortnight. And I was going, oh shit, you know, they're going to, you know, lost their job, they're going to sue me, they've broken up with their partner, it's going it's to be really bad. I was going, oh, oh really? And then they said, and Roger, that was the best two weeks of my life. <laughs> you get it?